Good morning, all things new. I'm Janet Burnside, Children's Pastor and Connections Leader, and I am so excited to welcome you to our virtual service today. Now for a few announcements about what's happening at All Things New. First, we invite you to partner with us um, and shop for good. You can find our salt and light shopping list on our website. There's a couple ways to do this. Number one, shop at your local stores and then email info at allthingsnew.church to set up a pickup time. You could also shop our Amazon shopping list and with one click have your donation sent directly to us. It's super simple. Our Salt and Light ministry cares for the vulnerable in our community, everything from kids who simply need books all the way to our homeless population and the elderly. In fact, I would like to share a little celebration about our new book benefit ministry. Last month when we launched this, we um, asked our All Things New community to help us by donating 100 gently used or new books um, for families in need. And that was blown out of the water. We received almost 300 um, books right here. You can see Station Help Freddy, the mastermind behind our book benefit um, ministry with uh, most of the books that we received. And um, we could not be happier about the way this started off. Now, this ministry, as well as all of our Salt and Light Ministries, continue going forward, and we are so appreciative for any way that you feel led to give. Next, ATN Kids, the children's ministry here at All Things New, would love to grow its presence on Instagram and Facebook. Um, you can help us with this, too. As we continue to meet virtually, I, Pastor Janet, will be um, updating our Instagram and Facebook accounts with um, posts about our weekly lessons um, from our curriculum. I'll be sharing content to support parents as well as other fun things. So even if you're not an ATN Kids parent, please follow at ATN Kids on Instagram or ATN Kids on Facebook and share our content to your page. Invite a friend to visit. Anything you can do. We would love it. You've heard me mention our website at least once so far. We do have a website, allthingsnew.church. You can find any information that I'm sharing here on our website, and you can find sermon videos and a lot of other content um, on our YouTube page. Please like and subscribe. Our faith in action groups have been going strong um, the second and fourth Tuesday and Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. There's a Tuesday group and there's a Thursday group just to clarify. <laughs> this week we'll be holding the last of those faith in action groups, Tuesday or Thursday, whichever group you are a part of at 7 p.m. We would love to see you there to close out these meetings. Another Zoom opportunity after this service, we'll be holding our after service Zoom. If you're missing the coffee donut chat with um, other people from your church family, please hop on our after service Zoom because that's what you'll find there. The link is on our website. Head there after this. Lastly, one more ATN kids announcement. We hold Zooms as well. On Tuesday afternoons, we meet with our kinder to second grade students at 2 p.m. and our kids in grades three through five at 4 p.m. That's what's happening at All Things New. We're so happy you're here and we hope to see you connect in one of these ways. This is from John chapter three, verses one through five. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, answered very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. We affirm the centrality of the word of God. And we affirm the necessity of the new birth. These, what I just said, these are the first two of the six guiding affirmations that shape the theology of our tradition uh, as a covenant denomination in a covenant church. We affirm the centrality of the Word of God. We affirm the necessity of the new birth. What does that mean? Well, the centrality of the Word of God, we see Scripture, uh, the Bible, as the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. We value and have from our beginning as a denomination the, the rigorous, scholarly, communal, orthodox interpretation of biblical texts. And we celebrate this as a defining characteristic of our tradition. We value interpretation. We, we, we celebrate continuing this tradition. 
and the necessity of the new birth, we agree with Jesus in this text here that participation in God's kingdom requires new birth. In this passage, in so many ways, it speaks to the foundational elements of who we are as Christ followers, and especially our tradition as the covenant church. What an important passage when we are considering how God is calling us to recover kingdom identity. Because we too often forget that we are, um, we are called to be a kingdom people. And we get sucked into all these other definitions of who we are. And we're going to take some time over the next several weeks unpacking some of those. But as Uruguayan theologian uh, Mortimer Arias reminds us, for Jesus, evangelization was no more and no less than announcing the reign of God. And Jesus describes this reign as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And here in John 3, he tells Nicodemus, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. So, let's wrestle with this text this morning. Why? Why does Jesus choose the metaphor of new birth? Why? What's the point of that? Why does he choose new birth? As God, right, we believe he could have chosen any way to describe uh, or to design even the process of how one sees the kingdom or enters the kingdom. For me, um, when I think of this new birth as a parent of of young kiddos, I immediately think of our own kids because not too long ago, this was something we were dealing with. Here is a shameless picture of our kids when they were little infants, Uh, you know, got to, got to, Got to show off the kiddos, you know, when I can. Um, there's Evelyn and Parker. And, and one thing I, I didn't know until I was, you know, a parent of, of uh, little kiddos is that infants, when they're new, uh, newborns, they, they cannot see the way that we are used to sort of seeing the world. That their, their vision has a very close range, and so you have to get up nice and close. And so they're learning their eyes Uh, learning how to use their eyes for basic functionality, like focus, drawing distinction between objects, etc. But they're also uh, learning to use their eyes for communication, for uh, figuring out who the ones are that are caring for them and learning facial expressions. And and so they're learning learning how to uh, perceive and they're learning how to interpret and and they're learning how to create meaning. And and then, of course, they're learning how to respond. And this is one of the infinite number of aspects of new life. And and in short, I think maybe Jesus chooses this metaphor of new birth and especially seeing, you know, as as the sort of new, new birth because it calls everything into renewal. Because we have to relearn. We have to relearn everything. We have to go through again this process of of basic functionality of, of how we understand the universe of which we are a part, and, and also learning the basic sort of ideas and understandings of how to communicate, how to perceive the world we're a part of, how to interpret the world we're a part of, how to create meaning, and then, of course, how to respond. How to respond as those who are newly sort of born into this kingdom. As Al Tazan says, you know, it's, it's important for us to recognize that the reign or the kingdom of God has a boundless and all-encompassing effect on the whole of existence, Right? The kingdom, is, it affects everything in all of existence, from the domain of the human heart to the cosmos and everything in between. And so a, a new birth is important for us to acknowledge that this new birth has to in, involve our sort of the internal and sort of the, the holistic uh, representation of who we are as, as this sort of humanity but it, and it has implications way beyond that. And, and the, the sort of boundless, all-encompassing effect on the whole of existence, it, it requires this whole new birth to be able to understand everything over again because it is so extensive and complete and utter. And perhaps Jesus uses this metaphor because kingdom language can all too easily remain in the realm of an abstract political entity, right? It can remain abstract, especially in the ancient world that was more accustomed and familiar with kingdoms. It would be easy for those things to remain in this sort of abstract realm where a kingdom so easily can, it encourages participation, but it doesn't require faithfulness. Or maybe it does, but with a heavy hand. 
where it brings a nominal identity, but it doesn't bring holistic transformation. It demands obedience, but it doesn't invite love. And in so many ways, Jesus is inviting us to new birth, to see this kingdom in a way that incorporates things like faithfulness, holistic transformation, and love. And so Jesus uses the metaphor of new birth to show us that his kingdom and in entering his kingdom requires an all-encompassing, a complete, an utter, an absolute or holistic spirit-led renewal of our whole lives. And the point is this, that we are all called to holistic spirit-led renewal. We are all called to holistic spirit-led renewal. And this means those who have never come to faith in Jesus, have never sort of experienced that new birth. But this also means those of us who perhaps have prayed the prayer, those of us who have walking with Jesus for years and years and decades and decades and maybe even centuries from of you, I don't know, you know, we are all called to, to holistic, spirit-led renewal. And I think the text this morning can help help us unpack that a bit. So when we say as a church, often we, re, we say it over and over, we are being renewed by God. This is in some sense what we're talking about. This, whole, this holistic renewal in our own heart, soul, mind, and strength to be able to participate and understand and perceive and create meaning and respond to the, the broader kingdom that God is, is bringing to this earth. Uh, as it is in heaven. And, and so we, we celebrate the, the sort of all things newness that Jesus invites us to. And as I say that, I mean, some of you might be saying like, I don't, hold on, man. I, you know, I, 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 wait a minute. I, like I've, I've, I've done this. I've, I've, I've been born again. I've, I've, I've experienced this new birth. I've prayed the prayer. You know, I've, it was, uh, I've been born from above. I've, uh, you know, it, good. And, and, and also, if we're honest with ourselves, if, if many of us are really, really truthful and authentic, many of us find ourselves at one point or another in this place where things just don't add up. Or, or, or things perhaps have come, gone down into a rut, or, or the faith that was so vibrant and, and life-giving and, and trans- just kind of seems, seems to be faded. We reach this point where things no longer make sense and we think we need to walk away from all of it. And that's something that I've noticed a lot in the church these days. Is that people see the sort of the, the broader landscape or maybe even specific experiences in their own churches and, or, or relationships that have gone to a place where there's such a gap between where they are feeling called and led as, as followers of Christ and where they see the broader movements of, of churches and, and trusted friends and, and family going in a totally different way. And, and there's this sense of like, maybe I just need to walk away from all of this. And there's this broad sweeping movement of this sort of kind of like unhealthy deconstruction where people are walking away from everything uh, that, that Jesus sort of stands for or that, that um, you know, we've seen embodied throughout the church because their, their faith or their worldviews or paradigms, they're, they're stretched so far or, or perhaps they're even broken to, to where they say, that's it, I'm done. I don't want anything to do with this. I'm out. And they walk away. I think we all know people, and perhaps this is you. We've gone through these kinds of seasons, and, and the reality is, I, I think most of us here at All Things New, we kind of represent this demographic uh, in, in really powerful, kind of sweeping ways that, that a lot of us, you know, we're not necessarily unchurched people. Like we've, we're not necessarily churched people. Um, a lot of us are in this space of de-churched, in this kind of like, I'm walking away from all, you know. But then a, a lot of us here at All Things New find ourselves in this sort of re-churched category. Where we've gone through these seasons of deconstruction. These gone, and, 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 and we're, we're on the, in this other place where perhaps we're saying to ourselves, yeah, maybe... Maybe there is something here with Jesus. Maybe there is something with the church that can be redeemed. We've experienced this kind of new birth again and again and again. I think we've all seen healthy, unhealthy deconstruction 
when instead what we need to do is acknowledge the need for a new birth again and realize that there is a time and a place uh, in the Christian walk to experience new birth, not just once when you pray a prayer sometime at some concert or when someone has you pray the prayer after an inspiring message or on a street corner somewhere, but this idea of new birth is a process that Jesus invites us to repeat by God's grace and God's Spirit. Because if we don't see Jesus continually inviting us to this holistic, spirit-led renewal, these kinds of seasons, these kinds of seasons where it's all not making sense, will crush you. They will crush you. So let's drill a bit, let's drill down a bit into the text where Jesus describes this new birth in order to see the kingdom of God. Let's drill down into it. Jesus uh, answered him, if, this is verse 3, Jesus answers Nicodemus, the Pharisee, right? He's, he answers him, he says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And then in verse 5, he says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. So in verse 3, he says, No one can see the kingdom uh, be, without being born from above. Uh, and then again, he repeats in verse 5, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Three observations for us. Uh, the first, three sort of textual observations. The first is this. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, comes at night. Uh, and there's some clear symbolism here in John's gospel. Darkness and light are symbols throughout. Uh, and here, Nicodemus comes at night. And, and uh, if you look at verse 1, there's this declaration where Jesus, in many ways, is uh, representative of this light. And it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. This declaration that, that Jesus is, is this light, and, and in, it, it, with his presence, with his embodied sort of divine essence. He is this light encountering darkness all throughout. And here in, verse, in chapter 3, uh, Nicodemus comes uh, shrouded in darkness. And so it's representative not just of uh, sort of good and evil, but, but here it represents uh, Nicodemus's spiritual darkness, his spiritual blindness. He doesn't see who Jesus really is. Uh, another observation, when Jesus says no one can see, no one can see um, and no one can enter uh, the kingdom, it's helpful to see here that the, what he's talking about is it's, it's, um, he's using that, what, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, the sort of dunamai, dunamis, you know, this, this, this power that um, uh, is sort of representative of ability, right, that someone can exert. Uh, power and so it literally, you know, it's kind of like people will not, cannot have the ability to see the kingdom, cannot have the ability to enter the kingdom. In other words, if you read the text, like Jesus is this gatekeeper saying, I'm gonna, you know, if you don't get born again, I'm not letting you in. Uh, uh, if you're not born from above, you're not getting it. That's not necessarily what the text is getting at. It, it's more of, um, look, those who, aren't, who don't experience this all-encompassing holistic renewal, those who don't experience a, a heart, soul, mind, strength transformation from in entirety, literally just don't have the ability to see God's kingdom. They don't have the ability to enter into it because it, they haven't gone through this relearning process of, of trying to relearn how to perceive and interpret and create meaning and respond. And then third, there's, you know, at one point he says see and then he says enter. And there's a theologian from India, Jay uh, Kenegaraj, and he says seeing really in, in some sense and entering kind of mean the same thing here. It's experiencing or tasting and then entering in, in some, in some sense represented um, the, the act of coming into the realm of God's kingdom and seeing God as king, right? So I think they, they go well here together. Um, Caroline Lewis notes that it's, it's also helpful to recognize that, you know, the synoptic gospels represent kingdom as this sort of uh, alternative to the, M the Roman Empire, uh, alternative to the other worldly empires where John's gospel focuses on kingdom as relationship with God. And the beauty of the sort of fourfold, you know, gospel presentations that we find in the New Testament is that we can, 
we see God's kingdom as, as both, right? As, as this alternative empire, alternative to empire, but it's also one, it's a kingdom that's marked with intimacy with the king, right? So I think it's just, it's just good. It's helpful to, for us to bring this within the broader context. Um, and, but today we're going to focus even further down on the, the sort of translation that in the NRSV is translated uh, from above, the sort of anothen uh, word. And in three different translations for you this morning, NRSV says we're in verse 3, Jesus says, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom without being born from above. Common English Bible says, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. And, and of course, in the NIV, there is this, uh, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So born above, born anew, born again, which is it? Which is the right interpretation? Uh, these are good questions to ask. Which is it? Which is the right? In- it's indicative of who we are. Remember our our tradition, who we are. We're the sin- we affirm the centrality of the Word of God. We take very seriously good interpretation, and we want to make sure that good interpretation shapes our tradition. It's very good. It's an important thing to do. And, and, and these are good questions, and it's likely um, that perhaps the Greek allows for at least you know, two of these, maybe all three of these, and, and perhaps there is, is room and importance in embracing all three um, uh, translations, you know, so the, the sort of born, the anothen, um, Lewis again, you know, argues that there is the sort of three-dimensional meaning to here, the, the, the sort of born from above, acknowledging the, the, the new birth by the, the Holy Spirit, the sort of grace of God coming and acting and, and enabling this new birth, born again, Born again perhaps refers to the, the call or the, the, um, the commandment toward baptism and, and acknowledging the sort of sacramental moment of, of new birth. And perhaps a new means this is, is getting at what we're talking about this morning, is, is more of this sort of repeated process of, of being born anew. Uh, the, the term that's, that's used throughout the rest of Scripture a lot in many passages throughout Scripture is this sort of sanctification, this this being born anew repeatedly, repeatedly. And we're invited as the reader to see ourselves in this text and consider how, how God is speaking to us and how we might respond in this moment. So, so this morning, with, in other words, maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time and yet, maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time and yet, and yet Jesus is still inviting you to be born anew today to see things differently for the first time, to experience a new birth where you can see and enter God's kingdom in ways that you never before imagined possible. Is it possible to read this passage and assume that instead of sort of disparaging and and looking down upon Nicodemus, perhaps there's an invitation to see ourselves as Nicodemus in this passage? as those in need of new birth. If that comes as a challenge to you, uh, let's take a closer look at the Pharisees. Hillel Newman and Ruth Ludlam argue that the two main characteristics that defined the Pharisees, that set the Pharisees apart from other Jewish sects in the first century, like uh, the Sadducees and the Essenes or Zealots, the two main characteristics that really kind of set them apart were their sort of twofold focus, accuracy in their interpretations, and maintaining their ancestral traditions. Does that sound familiar? That the first sort of affirm, affirmation that, that, that we celebrate that shapes who we are as, as a denomination, and, and really I think as a broader sort of Protestant tradition, is that we value good interpretation of biblical texts. And we hope that that shapes our tradition. And don't get me wrong, I I don't want to dismiss the importance of good interpretation, and I don't want to dismiss our tradition. And at the same time, it is easy to look down upon Nicodemus, but perhaps it is 
more fair and it's more honest for us to see Nicodemus as representing those of us who think we have Jesus all figured out. It's easy for us to see Nicodemus as someone who just didn't get it, but I think it's maybe more honest if we stop and we see Nicodemus as someone who represents us, represents those of us who think we have Jesus all figured out. If you notice where Nicodemus comes in and he calls Jesus what? He says he calls him a rabbi, he calls him teacher. And then Jesus responds in, in so many ways by saying, yes, I am those things, but you know what else I am? I am also your king. I am your God. Are we willing to see ourselves as those in need of renewal? Are we willing to see ourselves as those in need of renewal, like a Nicodemus who needs that new birth to see Jesus in new ways? Follow-up question, are we willing to avoid unhealthy deconstruction and embrace a spirit-led healthy deconstruction that leads to new life? Because part of that new birth, that new renewal process, acknowledges that there has to be deconstruction, that healthy deconstruction is part of the new birth process. There's the death to old self. And that's, that's all throughout the New Testament where Jesus himself said, take up your cross, lose your life so you can find it. And there's where a new creation, as Paul writes in, in letters to the Corinthians, and it, it, that is a fundamental part of who we are, that there's this sort of continued, continued process of deconstructing what we think we know in order to be, experience that spirit-led renewal, that new birth in order to see things more clearly. What does that look like? What does healthy deconstruction look like? I, I think there's a couple things. Uh, two things that you can just take, take if you want, uh, run with it if you want. First is be honest with God, and the second is to find guides. Be honest with God and find guides. First, be honest with God. Celebrate, celebrate and lean into the, uh, the great tradition of, of being given permission that you can pray prayers of raw authenticity to your Creator. Read the Psalms. Read through Ecclesiastes. Read through Job. Read through the wisdom traditions of the, of, that we have in our, in our, in our sacred text in, in, in the Bible that, that celebrate this idea that as God's children, we are invited, we are given permission to go before God with raw authenticity. So if you are in a season of unknowing, of everything seems like it's all fake, it's all for naught, like, go to God with that prayer and say, God, I have a hard time believing you're real. God, I'm having a hard time loving your church. We can pray those prayers and, and, and sit there with God in those moments of silence and, and do that. Be honest with God. And second, find guides. Um, there are many, oh, there are many who have gone before us down these paths of continued renewal. Learn from them, listen to them, talk to them. I think one of the things that, it, that was helpful for me to realize in, in sort of some of the times I've gone through seasons like this is, is to realize that there are so many who have gone before me that can speak wisdom into these moments of challenge and upheaval and, and death and to, to, to find new birth. We have a, a resource page on our website. I don't know if you know this. If you go to allthingsnew.church slash resources, we have books, we have podcasts, we have videos, we have all kinds of movie, you know, all kinds of things of, of, of resources of people who I think in many ways are speaking powerful truth to the church and who finds itself asking big questions these days about faith, the church, etc. We have our uh, rooted, growing, and resilient ministry where we have people who, have, who are these guides in so many ways who are coming along to, to listen and support people in their moments of, of upheaval and, and, and deconstruction, to, to walk with them and, and, and have those honest conversations. We have our faith in action groups where we get together and we say, okay, what does this look like for us to, to you know, live this out and, and mess up and get it wrong, but we still come back and try to do it again. 
And I'd encourage you to consider how, how some of these guides and, and we as, as some of these ministries may partner with God's Spirit in walking with you down a path of healthy renewal as you experience Spirit-led new birth. Because, here's why it matters. Here's Because if we don't regularly engage in this kind of renewal, one of two things will happen. If we don't engage in regular uh, renewal, spirit-led renewal, to, to experience this new birth in, in Jesus, to be born anew repeatedly, repeatedly, if we don't engage in this kind of renewal, one of two things will happen. The first potential uh, that could happen is we'll develop a faith that has stopped growing. It's become rigid. It's become legalistic. It's become angry. And it's become dead. If we don't engage in this kind of renewal, that is one thing that could happen. The other is that we simply walk away from the faith in Christ altogether. Those are the two options if we don't willingly engage in continued renewal. And if we read John 3 in its broader context, you see the spiritual darkness and blindness of Nicodemus the Pharisee, the religious expert, in John 3, it, it, it has much to say to those of us who have been in religious circles for a long time. Circles that pride themselves in interpretation and tradition like ours. That are in need of being born again or new from above yet again for the sake of renewing a relationship with our King and seeing the Kingdom. When we read it in its broader context, in contrast, to John 3. In John 4, Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman at a well. He talks with a Samaritan woman who, instead of encountering Jesus at night, meets him in the middle of the day, at high noon, who also perhaps has a questionable past and certainly has questionable theology, and yet she listens to Jesus. She engages with Jesus. She desires what Jesus has to offer, and she tells others about Jesus. May we, who can so easily identify with Nicodemus, may we be so humble to see the need for spirit-led renewal, like a Samaritan woman at the well. May we see that need for spirit-led renewal today and in the days to come. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, lead us to be born anew today. Lead us out of darkness into your light. Amen.